and welcome to a very special episode of Sales Ops Demystified. We are joined by Jag of Hihachi Vantara, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, Hitachi Vantara. But Hitachi yeah, <laughs> Vantara. Um, and so Jag has extensive uh, experience as kind of business analyst and sales operations, um, which we're going to be digging into in the next 20 to 30 minutes. Jag, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Pleasure to be here. So currently VP of EMEA Sales Operations uh, for Hitachi Avantara. Um, how did you initially get into the sales ops field? Uh, so, so I think I think if you look at the history of sales ops, it's you know probably no more older than probably 16 years as, as a profession. Um, so it wasn't really a function that was necessarily called out outright. I think you may have had other actors in the sense of a COO role, operations mm -hmm. analyst role, but really as a competency, I think you'll find it's no older than probably 16 years. So for me, I, I began as an analyst that was good with data, um, and that was really my forte at, at the very beginning of my career. And you know that was heavily um, around things such as Excel, Cognos, you know, access things of that order. When, when I was good at it, <laughs> uh, since then the the world, you know, the world's obviously changed a lot, and and data is more of something that could be visualized in many different ways and through many different tool sets. So you know, I kind of moved on from there to things like business objects, and and then. Um, progress more into management roles really which you know at this point if I'm the operator of the tool it's probably not the right thing because there's yeah. far better people than, than me and and then you know what I've really done over the last I guess half a you know I guess half a dozen years now really is being at the forte with things around P, uh, BI development so you know I've been privy to having teams that have orchestrated and run data sets are covering tools such as Power BI, ClickView, you know, taking what was kind of bespoke Excel type data and putting it into data lakes and scaling at mass across, you know, thousands of sales users through automation as opposed to needing, you know, bespoke ad hoc re reporting, which, you know, we're trying to kill as a trade both at this company and, and other companies I've been at. Got it. So you initially the, when you were first doing sales operations work, mm. you weren't mm. actually labeled sales operations. You were working with data that helped drive decisions for the sales team. Yeah, I would I would say the the, the competency overall. I think you know mid two thousands is probably where you would find it kind of came to a forefront under an umbrella as such. I mean, it used to be you know actors such as business operations, operations. You know, like you, you'd find an analyst left, right, and center in many organizations. And I think you'll find mid two thousands is where many companies were looking at people in those roles to then say, okay, all of these things together point towards what is now considered sales operations. And, you know, you found in their competency, such as compensation, process improvement, CRM, analysis, and, and those things together really form the basis of what you see sales ops today. And, and, you know, I've had purview to each of those attributes across the course of my career because to be good in sales ops at the top level you need to know each of those to some level experts in some but good working knowledge of all to really get an end-to-end -end view of the business got it and can you give us a picture of the sales ops team uh, where you currently <laughs> are like how many resources report into you yeah so uh so at my current employer i've, I've been here just over half a year now so Across EMEA, you know, we have a team of around 30 FTEs. So this is a this is a software hardware business. So a little mm -hmm. bit different to the 12 years I had in a prior company before this, where, you know, we didn't have to count, uh, focus in on things such as supply. So here we have a we have a selling motion. We have a you know obviously the sales process and a CRM that sits underneath that. But at the very end of this, you know, if it's if it's a hardware sale, we have to sell kit, which then needs to be you know shipped and sent for revenue recognition. So we cover that in entire kind of front end of the funnel to the back end, which is, you know, comp planning, uh, go to market planning, making sure that people have the right tools and visibility to do their jobs, you know, rolling up what is a sales forecast, making sure that we got the data sets to do this at a scalable modern way that's, you know, doing using automation as opposed to manual churn work. And then at the very end of that, we have to we have to make sure the stuff can actually get shipped, we get rev wrecked. And from time to time, obviously, things such as commission queries. So we're really tied in binary to the end-to-end -end process. And you know, as always in operations, there's room to improve this stuff, which is which is where the opportunity and challenges. Do you have a view on the like 
ideal ratio of sales off to salespeople? Do you have yeah, any? Actually, I think I think it's different depending on the maturity of the business. So I think a modern sales ops function in a modern organization, the numbers could be very different to the opposite. So I think it's a it's a journey, right? I think what, what this is about is putting in the building blocks to make sure you get the automation that you need, you know, throughout the entire sales process end to end. I think as you get that the position of ops changes to tactical, from tactical to strategic, right? Because then it's about not having an expert that can tell you what you need to know to run your business, but more about, well, how can you add value to me? Because the data, for example, if you're talking about analysis, is now on tap, right? I don't need a, an expert to get me data to tell me what my forecast is, right? I can see that for myself, right? So when you get to that level of maturity on the curve, then the value of ops is more about how can you strategically help me move forward as opposed to help me create a PowerPoint that explains something about my business to my boss because he asks me a question every week, for example, right? So so I think there's a there's a there's a journey that every org goes on. I don't think there's a magical ratio as such. Hmm. You know, clearly, clearly there's a better way to do everything. And I think once an organization matures, I think all of those spans and layers can look very different. Got it. Um Next question, and I want to ask about current sales ops tech stack that you're operating. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, no different to you know most people, right? I think choices out from a CRM perspective are largely based on, you know, Salesforce and Microsoft. You know, we, yeah. we are we are a heavy Salesforce user, uh, and you know, wherever I've worked before has been largely the same. Now, there's good implementations, there's bad implementations, right? So. You know, we we always have work to do in that capacity in every org I've been at. So mm -hmm. for us, it's Salesforce from the front end, and that ties us together from a marketing perspective, from a lead gen, and down to the sales reps from an account and, and opportunity mapping perspective in terms of the accounts and the leads, the opportunities, the contacts, et cetera, et cetera. So Salesforce is that, you know, that kind of middle layer. And then, you know, where we then go from there to quoting, is layered in through a you know configure price quote tool. So we, we use a tool currently here called FVX. Um, you know, seen various guises of something of a similar ilk. Ultimately, the challenge with all of these things is adoption, which is something that's front and center in our mind because you know Salesforce for me is only as good as the data that's in it. Otherwise, we're checking the box to have it. But you know, it, yeah. it needs to be something that's built into the DNA of sales, which means that we've obviously built it in a user-friendly way that, you know, it actually helps them and it isn't just for ops to do reporting from. So did you you actively work with the sales team to configure Salesforce in a way that they'd actually want to use it? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen this done well. I've seen it done averagely. Um, so, you know, I would say early, well, maybe it's mid 2000s now, we had our first rollout of Salesforce.com at a prior company I was at. and you know, I was kind of, you know, seconded over to be the representative of EMEA at the time for that type of project. And I would tell you, like, that, that, that was the classic case of kind of ops trying to design the world without maybe thinking about the persona of the sales user at the time. And mm -hmm. I just think the maturity of what a CRM should look like, I don't think anybody necessarily knew what it needed to be. But as we got better at it and we started recognizing things like sales process as a function and not a spin-off project, what then became from it, was other spin-offs such as you know going to constantly look at our processes and revise what they are to make sure they're optimum for sales as opposed to being built for operational reporting and, and then from there what we created was user clinics with the end users but you got to be careful with who you listen to as well right because you know everybody has a good idea and you feel something to add but at the end of the day you know what you can end up with is a, is a lot of clutter and nothing that's actually very useful to, to actually get the basics of the job done. And, and you know, from time to time, it's been known of every company I've been at to have to go back to the simplistic view of an opportunity and start cutting back the number of fields that have been added through good intent, but, you know, have lost the basic DNA of what CRM is. And uh, we have a quick question from Zach. Have you seen changes or shifts uh, in the role? And if so, how do you overcome them? I guess is this is looking back at your 18 or so years. Yeah, I would say, look, if things are still the same as, as they were 10 years ago, you know, you're clearly doing the wrong thing, right? Mm -hmm. the, the industry's moved on so much. Um, 
you know, you know, if I think about what an ops role looked like 10 years ago and the kind of things it was doing for a sales leader, for, for example, if it's at the sales partnership level, you know, it, it was very different. I would say you probably spent 60 to 70 percent of your time crafting through data so that you could then go and spend the, the rest of the delta to go and, you know, explain to the sales leader where the business is. Whereas now in that example, this stuff's on tap, right? You know, if you build it well and you have good data, then you can scale, right? You can scale at a much better level. So the position therefore is now about, well, now that now that everyone can see everything, which is, you know, a good principle in life, you shouldn't only have ops or finance that can understand your data. How do I now take that forward and drive this into action, which is really where the fun happens, right? So that's where I see the big pivot is, you know, the, the days of being good in ops and having a career just because you know the inner working of a company or you know how the data works. That, I mean, that's gone, right? And if that's still happening at your organization, I think you're in trouble because, you know, we need to empower people to move forward. Nice. Um, you touched on data quality in it and Salesforce only being as powerful as the data within it. Um, mm -hmm. Who is responsible for data quality in your team um, and how are you currently dealing with that? It's, you know, it's, it's different in different places. So I think, again, it's a maturity curve. So I think once you've got the muscle memory, you know, you're more mindful of the downside of not having good data. Um, but you need to you need to go on a journey before you can even kind of respect the issues that you cause by not having it. So, for example, you know, I think we all own it. Right. So if you're a sales guy and you don't have a passion to put your contacts in Salesforce, well, that's not going to help us. Right. If you're a marketing person, you can't therefore do a campaign. If you're in support and you have contacts from you know, end users with queries and you're not making sure that's a capture point, that's again an issue. So I think every single department owns it, but what you gotta have is you gotta have uniform systems that integrate across those contact points to make sure that there truly is an end-to-end -end tie in. And I would say, you know, the bigger the company, the bigger the issue, but sometimes just having pilots to get that right in small pockets is the way you start, you know, getting a little bit smarter at it. So mm -hmm. we just, you know, I think getting the, the platforms unified is the key first step. But again, it comes back to, Am I building a CRM to do reporting or am I building a CRM to drive interaction with the customer and with the sellers? If you know, it should always be the latter. And I think if you have that natural thing happening, it's a flywheel effect. And I think it just naturally feeds itself. I think that's a really big insight because sales ops of people want to build the thing to give them or they want to build it for their own <laughs> in reality that is only going to be the best for the business if it's built with your interests but also with the interest of everybody else using it. Absolutely, yeah. That's yeah, a big yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's a chicken and egg, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you, you want this balance between having inputs that have useful outputs, but if it's all about the output, then, you know, that's just not gonna be the user experience, right? I mean, if you take that back to normal life for, for you and me, if our social media was all about what one of those companies could get out of it, I don't think I would go in there, right? So. Mm -hmm. And you could argue we're probably on the the tipping edge of probably being too much like that from you know from my experience of some of these some of these kind of systems. But we, there is a delicate balance there, right? Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to be as bad as what you've designed. Yeah, as bad as Facebook. Um, <laughs> getting buy-in. So you, you, you mentioned just now about having people in customer success or in marketing managing or helping with data quality. How do you get buy-in from those? other disparate teams in the organization to help you with your goals? Yeah, I mean, you are the most mature companies I've been at, right? I mean, if you think about the annual planning cycle, right, you, you sit there with product development, you determine what products you're going to roll out the roadmaps to make them better. You then go and determine the budget for the campaigns that are going to go and underpin those things. You've got your captive sales audience that need those things to be useful in the marketplace. Then you've got customer success, that obviously need to tie those things out to, from a support perspective. So I think it comes back to what is the quality of your planning cycle and how much are you truly engaging across all those elements and how much, you know, perversely is done in a silo where you're not thinking across the entire landscape. And, you know, where I've seen this work well, you know, we did something, for example, you know, maybe 18 months ago now, we called it a plan of record, which was effectively, okay, what's the plan of record for product? You know, what are the goals? What are the commitments? What's happening on market? And what's happening with sales? And what's happening with success? And then you're kind of binary because, you know, everyone's success is dependent upon each other and everybody's accountable to delivering what they said they would deliver. Otherwise, you know, we, we all will fail together. So I think it's it's about making sure that that connectivity happens from how you plan 
because then you have common goals and, and ambitions to be successful together. Got it. So actually you need to zoom out and you're like in the annual planning process, if everyone's aligned with the goals you're trying to achieve, then they're going to be bought in to what you're trying to do. Yeah, but you gotta you got to be willing to, to own the planning outside of planning, right? I mean, where I've seen planning done not greatly is, you know, you issue your comm plans, the gun's gone off, we will go in a dark cupboard and come back again like three months to go from the end of the year to plan for the following year. You gotta you gotta live it into the DNA of what you agreed to make sure you know you're delivering against it. Otherwise what you find is um, you know, your accounts, the segmentation didn't quite get managed the way that you expected, you know, the data quality goes down because if you narrow in on only quality during planning and don't live it, then you know, you you're just resetting the wheel every six to eight months when whenever you kick off your planning cycle. Got it. Um, can you share some insights around onboarding salespeople? I assume with the 400 people in the sales team, you have some, hmm. some gems of knowledge to share about that. Yeah, I mean, look, my my overall experience, I would say, if I looked across the board holistically of the roles I've had, is company onboarding generally is you know good at the company level onboarding in terms of the products how to go to market with them, you know, how to go and talk them to the, to the key customers about them. Now, day one in the job is for me where ops really kicks in because, you know, I often find every company I've been at, there's a terrific onboarding kind of company level process. Sometimes, you know, it's local, sometimes overseas, but day one in the job is, okay, you know, how do I use Salesforce in real life, real combat? How do I create a quote and get it through the motion of an approval process? And that, that's where you need, you need a more holistic view from ops at the back end, which is more of an operational kind of onboarding piece. And, and, and a buddy system works well, right? I mean, sometimes people just need regular clinics, places to call into. And I think if you have that chemistry, then you're going to have people be more effective day one as opposed to all hell breaking out at the end of a quarter trying to get a quote through and they, they don't know what they're doing. So, you know, there's there's different levels of maturity at different places I've worked, but that's the that's where I've seen it working best is when you contribute at the ops level to really do that. From day one as soon as they join. Yeah, yeah. In the job, post training. Yeah. Post the company onboarding, you know, because that's that's when real life really kicks in with with a lot of these guys. Yeah, you spend like a week or two just like in a classroom, like learning about stuff, like <laughs> inspired, and then you realize like, oh, I actually have to do this. Um, productivity of sales reps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, how do we measure, um, which I think is the kind of proxy for your question. So, so really, you know, in terms of talent management, right, it's, it's, a, it's a key contributor to what I've worked on over the last five years at different places and spaces. So, you know, you got to have a, you got to have a contribution of subjective and objective, right? It can't just be a bunch of ops and finance data and HR data. It's, you got to, you got to be cognizant of what the manager thinks, because ultimately what you're trying to get to is a consistent benchmark of what good looks like, right? So what we were big advocates of, and we saw this then scale globally into a standard process was um, making sure that we took the best of all, all, all of these breeds of data and management views to try and get a consistent view. But the trick is to do this through automation, not a one-time pony for a QBR, and then you walk away and then, you know, nothing happens, right? So mm -hmm. for me, what we started to do was we started to look at um, a balance of subjective and objective, right? So the subjective pieces were things like, what's the skill of the individual, right, to do their job? So you would have a grading, you know, of one to five for that. You'd have a grading of one to five for will, a grading of one to five for coachability. And, you know, there was very consistent markers for, for what you need to be to be at the top, top level of that, right? So that's that's a, that's a management view, right? And we would also, in addition to that, ask the managers two other questions, which was, if this person left the company, what's the impact to the company? And are they a flight risk, right? So then that kind of gets the management view of the individual mm -hmm. on the table. But then what we would do is, you know, to to elevate the conversation is we would add some of the objective data in. So you'd have the company records, so you'd have things like attainment, coverage, win rates, profitability, you know, performance data, training hours, so you know, how many, how many, how many, how many classes have they attended that are going to help them improve in their job. And then what you end up with is, is the best of both the subjective and the objective. And then really, you know, where you end up is, okay, if I'm going to go do a QBR in Brazil, 
I've already got all of my employees rated by the managers in an online tool, perhaps, which is which is how we rolled with this. And it meant every one of our QBRs was consistent. And what would happen is the leader in that particular market or geo or segment would stand there and talk about their people. But then, you know, what would happen in the room amongst the other managers is that they would look at those ratings and say, well, hold on. The data doesn't quite say that the rating is the way you have it. But then you get that transparency between the management set of what does good look like by having all of this kind of joint up together. But you have to do this in a scalable way because you know that's how you get to that consistent view of what good looks like without creating the you know the weeks of operations work to create content and decks if you will to show that view of the business but i think if you get to that maturity curve and you have a sales leader driving it not not an ops person by the way that's really kind of preaching this to his guys or girls then i think you really get to elevate it right because i think it becomes a becomes a scalable model becomes a consistent model and the kpis Mm -hmm. become something that get lived as opposed to, you know, a one-time show. Was that something that you implemented, like this subjective mm. and objective? That was something Correct. that you brought. Yeah, yeah, nice. that was, uh, yeah, that was something we implemented uh, globally across twelve hundred employees. Oh wow! Yeah. And did you did you bring that over from a previous business, or did you like? How did you like? Um, so we we had a we had a new sales leader who had some ideas. Um, we had our own ideas and it was just the formation of the two of those things together. But what we wanted to do was to be a bit edgy and drive this through technology as opposed to, yeah. you know, just tech check in the box. And, and then what we ended up with it was a standard that was then actually then being pushed around the other 11,000 employees in the organization to go down the same route. But it came from a fabric of trying things in a more innovative way as opposed to just you know, okay, well, here's the PowerPoint. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and you know, it really elevated our brand for a part of the business that was going for a huge turnaround. In fact, we took it from negative year over year growth for two years to, to growth. And I think one of those things was just starting to get some accountability back into the org through being, you know, good at how we managed our people. So to be clear, you, you were rolling this out just for sales reps, but then the business saw the impact and then took it yeah, to everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, that one got to the board level presentation and we were in the process there to then roll that out across the bigger half of the company across you know all of the direct sellers the indirect sellers and to make that a standard for the company nice i bet that felt pretty good it did <laughs> <laughs> yeah it also created a lot more work <laughs> oh, yeah that's true um quick question this is a very broad one so it'd be interesting mm. to get your take um and i might actually challenge you to try and mm keep the answer to this to like two sentences, which mm. I think will be interesting. Um, how do you define and measure success in sales operations? Speed, one word. Nice, you know, one word. We gotta, if we're not making something you know, faster in a better way, of course, mm. then what are we doing, right? Are we just keeping the lights on? So you know, everything we do needs to drive more speed. Speed. Um, KPIs, what are you currently tracking? Or maybe a better question is, what, hmm. what do you think are the most valuable KPIs for you as sales ops leader? So I think it's different depending on the issues that you're experiencing. So if you're experiencing growth, the KPIs are you know different. If you're experiencing you know some momentum shift downwards, you know you, you're look, looking a little bit harder for the answers. So you know I think that there are some basic principles, right? You know you want to get into how much pipeline are people generating? How many leads are they, you know, are coming through to them? What's the quality of, of the stuff that's in the funnel? You know, how, how much is in there? It's just age that is going absolutely nowhere. How much accountability are you then being able to drive with the metrics, right? Is it visible to just me? Or is it visible down to the individual manager that's managing the sales executive, right? So it's being very thoughtful about what you measure depending on the situation, but making sure most critically this stuff is not held for a corner office somewhere, but instead it's, it's you know, it works at the top down to the, the bottom of the layer because at the end of the day, metrics are only good if they drive action at the bottom. So we've got to be thoughtful what we build and how we share because obviously there's some privacy issues you've got to then sometimes work through when you share too much. But, but for me, everything we design needs to work both at the macro and, and down to the manager that's managing the sales exec. Got it. Um, and a final question is who taught you what you know about sales operations? 
I've had um, I've had I've had a bunch of great experiences at many companies I've worked. I've had some really good mentors. Um, you know, th there's two that really stick out for me. At a, at a prior company that I would say were the biggest contributors for me. So you know, there's a guy called Joe Renz who does a lot now with AI and, and automation with cars. And uh, and then there's there's another guy that I worked with at CA, Oliver Maskell, who who now works for a a uh, a technology company that is uh, similar to a fruit, so you may guess the company. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's doing something great there at the moment with, with sales ops with, with that company. So and they, they've probably been the, the two best that I've worked with, both from a mentoring and day-to-day and -day leadership perspective. So it's Oliver and James? Oliver and yeah. Joe Renz, yeah, yeah. Shout out. Um, okay, so I've got a whole like host of little, little bullet points that I wrote down here, so let me try and cover them. Um, Always work to do. I think that's always worked it on the sales process or the CRM. I'm not sure what I wrote there. Um, Salesforce only being as good as the data that sits within it. Um, everybody owning and being responsible for data quality, and you can do that effectively by planning together and getting people yeah. bought in. Um, the, the pretty like automated and super interesting way you rolling out performance reviews with both the subjective and the objective data, and then finally sales operations success being measured by speed absolutely yeah there we go you know it. <laughs> oh no you, you know it jack um that was an absolute master class um thank you so much for your time and i'm sure that was invaluable for for people listening oh thank you it's been an absolute pleasure thanks for your time guys cheers